All right, good afternoon. Thanks for coming. Uh, I'm Dr. Allison Arwady, Commissioner at the Chicago Department of Pu Public Health. We are here to give a COVID update. Uh, pleased to be joined by Pedro Martinez, the CEO of Chicago Public Schools, uh, Dr. Ali Sontag, a nurse practitioner with the Office of Student Health and Wellness at Chicago Public Schools, and Dr. Geraldine Luna, Medical Director at the Chicago Department of Public Health. So first, our travel advisory. Uh, as of today, we are removing California, Guam, and North Carolina from the travel advisory. There are new, no new states being added. You can see most of the country still, 38 states are in orange, meaning for unvaccinated travelers, you should be testing before and after uh, and quarantining. This again does not apply to fully vaccinated travelers. I do want to note that Michigan, Minnesota, and Wisconsin currently have the highest rates of COVID-19 in the country per capita. Uh, obviously, these are all close to Chicago. It's part of why we are doubling down on our efforts to get folks vaccinated and continue to protect Chicago. Here in the city, uh, here is where our numbers are in terms of our risk levels. So we're currently averaging just under 500 cases per day. Uh, that's actually down a little bit, but largely that's because of changes in testing patterns over the Thanksgiving holiday, which I'll talk about. Uh, that does keep us in the high transmission or the high risk status uh, from CDC. Our test positivity is at 3.5%, uh, which puts us in the lower transmission. We're still doing plenty of testing. For hospital capacity, we're at that substantial transmission risk. Uh, where there's approximately 300 Chicagoans hospitalized but not in the ICU with COVID on a given day. And then we're averaging about 86 uh, Chicagoans in the ICU with COVID. Um, so that's where we are overall. I wanted to just highlight the, the holiday patterns here. Uh, so as of November 22nd, we were averaging over 600 cases, 613 cases per day. Uh, as of today, though, we're at 493. A lot of that is because with the four day weekend around Thanksgiving, we see a big drop off in people being tested, being diagnosed. In that setting, we see positivity come up, uh, but we see a dip. And so you can see last year, uh, we, were, we were on the decline, but you can see in blue there for last Thanksgiving and then purple last Christmas, we saw a dip and then sort of a rise. That's a combination of both a change in testing and likely some increased transmission uh, that occurs in the setting of holiday gatherings. So I just wanted to highlight highlight that we would expect to see a similar pattern, but we won't, we, we, it would be too early to be seeing it at this point. Uh, test positivity is continuing to increase at 3.5%, uh, but we have adequate testing uh, doing typically 20,000 tests or more a day uh, in the absence of uh, the Thanksgiving holiday. As you know, last week we did hit that 77% goal uh, in honor of Chicago's 77 community areas where 77% of Chicagoans aged 12 and up have received at least one dose of a COVID-19 vaccine. But there is definitely still more work to do. And particularly in the setting of this new news about the Omicron variant, it is important that people get, get vaccinated now. Uh, in terms of landmarks uh, and benchmarks across the city, citywide, we are now at 77.2% of those uh, age 12 and up having had a vaccine. And this week, some of the milestones we hit, Roseland hit 60%. Uh, Chicago Lawn hit that 77% mark. The near west side reached 80%. And West Lawn down in the southwest there hit 90% of Chicagoans 12 and up having had that first dose. So congrats to all of those community areas. Every single week, we are seeing seeing communities hit these important benchmarks and make really good progress. The dark blue on the map here shows us the community areas that have hit at least that 77%. And we continue to be very focused on the community areas that are not there yet, but we are making good progress in all areas. Similarly, where we look at the uh, percent that have a completed vaccine series, uh, meaning they've had both of those doses for Pfizer or Moderna, we're at just under 71% as the city. And you can see in dark blue, uh, relatively fewer communities that have hit 77% fully vaccinated. So um, it's good, but it's not quite good enough, particularly with variants emerging. 
Uh, the uptake among five to 11 year olds for vaccines does continue to rise. You know, we've been working with CPS closely on this and I've been pleased with the relatively uh, quick uptake here. We've hit 23%, uh, so almost one in four of Chicagoans five to 11 have had that first dose. And we're just starting to see those second doses come in because it's been almost three weeks uh, or just about three weeks. So just about 1% have, but we expect, uh, especially this coming weekend, a lot of five to 11 year olds to get that second dose. Um, and again, doing this now helps you be more protected uh, as we head into the holidays at the end of the year. Where can you get your child a vaccine? We keep getting questions about this. There are about 200 locations across Chicago with pediatric vaccine. There are almost 700 locations across Chicago with adult vaccine. So lots of places with vaccine. Best place to start is with your pediatrician, your family doctor or clinic, your hospital or your pharmacy. Uh, there are also community-based events. This Saturday, we're at Daly College um, uh, from nine to two and Wilbur Wright College uh, on Sunday from nine to two doing second doses for kids that got their first doses, uh, as well as, of course, initial COVID doses for everybody. And Protect Chicago at Home. As a reminder, 312-746-4835 is the number that anybody can call with any question about vaccine, anybody who needs help finding a vaccine, finding a booster, finding a vaccine for your child, give us a call. We are in the process of, of scaling back some of the community-specific events that tend to have relatively smaller numbers, we're moving that capacity actually into our at-home program. So starting next week, for the first time, we will be expanding our at-home program to seven-day operations. So the first appointments will be available on weekends starting uh, December 11th. That is in concert with already having evening availability. Uh, and it's just, you know, it's you call that number, we bring a vaccine free to your house. Uh, when people are getting their first or second doses of vaccine, you do get that financial incentive, the $100, uh, but more importantly, you get the protection. So we're, you'll be hearing us backing off on more of the community-based events, putting additional effort into here, um, and uh, of course, continuing to monitor where we need to make sure there's vaccine availability and awareness. You'll hear more about CPS's work on that. So as I said, always, if you need a vaccine, you need a booster, you have a question, 312-746-4835 or chai.gov slash COVIDVax. Uh, getting vaccinated now in time for the holidays, you can still get a J&J &J before December 11th to be vaccinated for Christmas, December 12th for Kwanzaa, or December 17th for New Year's Eve. Very quickly on Omicron, I spent a lot of time on it on Facebook this morning. So if you want to see the science or talk about it, it's posted on the page. Um, but I just wanted to high level, make sure people know what we're doing about it here. So it's been just two weeks since this new variant was detected. November 11 to 14 were when specimens were collected in Botswana and South Africa that later were identified as Omicron. Uh, and then November 23 is when it was sequenced in South Africa. I really want to note this is incredibly fast for this kind of work. Um, and it's really an, a, an example of the investments that have been made, um, not just nationally, but internationally in terms of this higher level of testing and surveillance. And I really wanna congratulate South Africa for not, ha not only having built this system, um, but having being very transparent and open um, about the emergence. So uh, by November 24th, we were seeing reports in a number of countries. November 26th, this was designated a variant of concern by the WHO, and I'll remind you what that is. Um, as of yesterday, it had already been detected in Africa, in Asia, Australia, Europe, um, in Canada. It had not been detected in the US, but I have no reason to think that there are not at least a few cases of it here, and I would expect us to uh, be formally detecting it in, in um, days or weeks. Uh, this is the current worldwide distribution. Uh, most of these have been linked to travelers at this point from Southern Africa. Uh, as a reminder, viruses do replicate. They copy themselves, which is what leads to the mutations. Viruses have to be in a human or in an animal to copy themselves. And it's when they are copying themselves millions of times over, your immune system is trying to fight off that virus, but it doesn't happen before the copies are made. The virus is trying to spread 
spread and the mutations are just in all of that copying if an error gets made in the genetic code a little change in the genetic fingerprint when the virus copies that error can get passed on if we see one of these errors make the virus stronger in some way make it easier to get into the host make it more contagious uh, make the vaccines less likely to work that virus that version of the virus that variant of the virus is the one that's likely to outcompete the other ones and it's the ones that's likely to you're going to detect it the most that's what we've seen in delta so the point is the more virus that is circulating in a population the more the virus itself can change so here in chicago yes we care about protecting you and your families with vaccine but it also helps cut down the risk for mutations because it cuts down the risk of spread. When we see mutations is when the virus copies itself and spreads. And so it's important that we think not just about vaccine here in Chicago, but internationally. As you know, I shared previously, I'm really proud of the fact that the Chicago Department of Public Health is, I believe, the only jurisdiction, the only city or state in the country that successfully returned vaccine to be sent internationally when we had a lot of unused vaccine here on the shelf. I just was not comfortable. My team was not comfortable with letting that go to waste. I've worked internationally, including in South Africa and Botswana, and we have such good monitoring, cold storage, security, inventory systems here, best in the country, that we were able to meet all of the requirements to actually return and send that vaccine international. It's just a small piece, but it is critical that as a world, we think about making sure we are cutting opportunities for variants. All right. Um, as a quick reminder, there are three levels of variants. If you remember nothing else, try to remember this. When variants first get noticed, they're called a variant of interest, a VOI. It means we're interested in this variant. We're seeing repeated transmission, but we don't necessarily know that it's bad from a public health perspective, okay? Next level is a variant of concern meaning we're seeing repeated transmission and we're concerned about it. Why are we concerned? Maybe it's more transmissible, it's more contagious. Maybe it's more able to evade our immune system, either from prior infection or for vaccine. Maybe it's making us sicker. Maybe it's making our treatments less likely to work. Any of these things means that that variant can be labeled a variant of concern. There have only been five variants of concern identified by the WHO, Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, and now, right away, this one was already labeled a variant of concern. It was not a variant of interest first because of the way it emerged in South Africa uh, and because we're already concerned about it, even as we're learning more about it. There is a third level of variant, variant of high consequence. We have not had one of these yet. If we get a variant that is labeled a variant of high consequence, literally that means we're highly concerned about it, uh, that really the vaccines are not working well, or really there's been some major change that's a big, big setback. It's possible that Omicron could be designated a variant of high consequence, but it has not been yet. Right now, it remains a variant of concern because we think it is likely more transmissible, more contagious than Delta based on the pattern that we were seeing in South Africa. Uh, it may be more likely to evade our own immune system's lessons, meaning we may see more breakthrough infections in people who are vaccinated, and we may see more repeat infections in people who previously had had COVID. We don't have any real evidence at this point that it's making people sicker, but they're still doing the work to figure that out. Uh, and at this point, the treatments, especially the oral treatments that should be coming soon, should work just fine. The testing also should work just fine. So it's going to take two to three weeks to finish some of the testing about how well the vaccines respond. Uh, it's going to take a couple of weeks to do the follow up of people who've been infected with this Omicron variant to see how sick they get, to see how their responses are. Uh, but we're in that middle category right now, which means, yes, I'm concerned about it. No, the sky is not falling, but we need to be serious and we need to get people vaccinated now. 
Uh, just to show you this visually, and I talked about this on Facebook. Remember, a variant is just the fancy name for a version of the virus that has a pattern of mutations in the genetic fingerprint. And what you see here is each of those columns shows you the variant, I mean, shows you the mutation um, that we've seen. So like that one on the left there, you don't have to see the details, but that's alpha. That was the first big variant of concern. And you can see counting down there, it had about seven of those variants and uh, of those um, uh, mutations on the top and then three on the bottom. That one on the right there is Omicron. So it's got 50 different mutations, by far the most that we have seen in any uh, virus to date. Those ones on the top, they share with other variants. So it's got some of the same mutations that Delta had. It's got some of the same mutations that Beta had. It's got some of the same mutations that Alpha had. And that's why we can know just from looking at the genetic fingerprint that probably this is gonna be more contagious, that there's a good chance we're gonna lose a little bit of that protection at least from the vaccines, uh, but we're still learning. And then all those ones on the bottom are some new, uh, new mutations that we've not necessarily seen in other uh, variants and that we're still learning about. A lot of these mutations are also in what's called the spike region. That's often where, that's, that's the part of the uh, virus that is trying to get into the cell and where, where we see changes in that, we know those can sometimes be a problem. So. Uh, just to sort of finish out on the evidence, um, this is, besides the genetic fingerprint, we're concerned because of how quickly this emerged in South Africa. Everything has been Delta, okay, for months. Here in Chicago, here in Illinois, here in the US, even around the world, Delta was very contagious. It was a very strong variant and it outcompeted everything else, which is good news for us. When the, when the virus is not changing, it gives us a good chance to get people vaccinated and stop more and more of uh, the opportunity for variants to emerge. However, what we see here from South Africa is the number of days that it took uh, for most of the virus in the country to be a certain variant. So in green there is the beta variant. It took about 100 days to get to a point where half of the virus in South Africa was the beta virus. Uh, beta variant. If you look at the blue line, that's the Delta variant. It took about 100 days to get to the point where 90% of the virus in South Africa was the Delta variant. Red is the Omicron variant. So it took about 10 days to get to the point where 90% of the virus that they're detecting in South Africa is that Omicron variant. So it's clearly quite competitive. We, there's more to do, but that's part of why we're worried. Uh, and so we think it's likely that it's more transmissible. We think it's likely there will be some more immune escape, um, meaning that humans are less likely to be fully protected as a result of vaccination or prior infection. Note that fully protected. Uh, we still absolutely expect that the vaccines will continue to have uh, some protection, especially against severe disease. We're still learning there's different kinds of immune antibodies and T cells, lots to learn. Critical that you get vaccinated, critical that you get boosted, okay? That's going to also really help. Uh, we're still learning about treatments. Uh, we're still learning about severe disease, and testing looks fine. Uh, nationally, the U.S. announced na uh, restrictions from eight countries in Southern Africa yesterday. I wouldn't be surprised if we see some increased testing and quarantine requirements for international travelers coming. Uh, as a reminder, the city of Chicago's travel advisory is only for domestic travel. Uh, we defer to the CDC on international travel. And locally, what are we doing about this? So I'm pleased to say that, uh, you know, for a year or so, we have been doing uh, much, much more of this kind of variant checking, uh, genomic sequencing than we'd ever done before. The Chicago Department of Public Health, we did not have this capacity prior to COVID. There was some capacity at the state lab, but it was not something that has been invested in, honestly, at the uh, national level. So as the CDC has been providing us additional funding, we, like many places around the country, have been building up the capacity to do the sequencing. So we have something called Ripple, the Regional Innovative Public Health Laboratory that is specifically uh, testing four variants across Chicago. Our, it's federal funding, and our main collaborator here is Rush University Medical Center, but we partner with multiple hospitals across Chicago, uh, and at really every week we're asking them to send us a random sample of uh, positive COVID tests so that we can do that genetic fingerprint on them. And this sample is representative of the city population in terms of demographics and geography 
geography. Uh, we partner with so many hospitals in the state and obviously the feds. Um, and then in addition, there are labs that do their own sequencing. No matter where you are in the world, when you are doing sequencing, it is all being uploaded into a single database. And at the national level, um, we actually have the capacity now to detect a new variant or say the Omicron variant all the way down to 0.01%, meaning if one in 10,000 infections is this Omicron variant, it will get picked up. So I expect it likely to be picked up relatively soon. We are increasing our Chicago-wide collection of sampling for genetic sequencing. We're asking these partner um, hospitals to double the number of uh, samples that they're sending us. And in addition to the routine surveillance, we also look for situations that might be concerning, where we are seeing an outbreak, where we are seeing unusual breakthroughs. If we've seen somebody get COVID for a third time, we're wanting to look some more at that um, to see whether those might be variants. So that's two different kinds of additional genetic testing that's happening here. Uh, it's one of the areas we've grown in the most, and it's something that we've really needed to grow in the most uh, in public health. Um, there's also some additional things that can be done in the laboratory and additional PCRs to test that can speed it up. And then we are also continuing our local wastewater sampling efforts. Um, if folks are not aware of this, this is really a innovative public health tool that again, we did not have in place prior to COVID. We've been working with many, many partners to grow this. The idea is that um, as opposed to waiting for someone who has COVID symptoms to go and get a test and trust that that's all going to happen, you can actually sample um, the sewage uh, because if somebody has COVID, you can find COVID in their poop. Uh, and you're able to actually, there, as this has been developing, you can use it to look at things like levels of opioids, uh, levels of all different variants, uh, not variants, different viruses, uh, levels of COVID. And here even, um, we're working, in, in this case, the uh, Discovery Partner Institute at University of Illinois at Chicago is the main partner here. The Walder Foundation really got us started on this here, and now we've gotten some additional funding. But there's lots and lots of academic partners. Argonne National Lab is the one that's working on the primer for Omicron, should have that this week. Um, and in addition to being able to sample sort of at the city level, how how much COVID are you seeing? You can actually do some sampling at manhole levels to see what's happening in neighborhoods. We've been doing some sampling. Again, this isn't a preliminary kind of way at Cook County Jail, where you can see if you're sampling from different uh, you know, units of the jail. Do we have a case in there? If we have a case in there, let's get in there. Let's test. Let's vaccinate. Let's do this. We're planning to add some additional local wastewater sampling at O'Hare. This doesn't tell you who has COVID or the variant but it tells you that it's there and it helps give you a sense. So this is an example of some of the really innovative new public health uh, laboratory work that we have now in Chicago as a result of uh, COVID investments. Um, so in a final, we are well placed to detect on Omicron variant and we likely will soon. I am not concerned about detecting the variant, I'm concerned about how we respond to it. How we respond to the variant is all about getting vaccinated, getting boosters, as a reminder, all Chicagoans, 18 and over, should get a vaccine booster six months after getting Pfizer or Moderna or two months after getting J&J. &J. Keep wearing those masks indoors and keep doing the things that have gotten us this far, staying home if you're sick, hand washing, distancing. I don't have anything else magic to offer you with the Omicron variant. I have the vaccines. They remain excellent, especially at protecting uh, for severe outcomes. and. I don't want this to go on forever, just like you don't want this to go on forever. Please take the opportunity right now to get that vaccine. Safe, effective, available, and we've got to stop sitting on vaccine here in the U.S. and get it to the rest of the world. That is what is going to stop these sorts of variants emerging. That's what's going to actually finally get the world past COVID. So get it done now. Get your booster. We'll be ready for whatever comes. And thanks again for everything that you've been doing to get us this far. I'll hand it to uh, CEO Martinez. Thank you, Dr. Awadi. And I want to thank all of our families who have been getting their children vaccinated. But again, I want to continue to encourage all of our families because we can't stop till we get a higher percentage of both our 12-year-old students as well as our 5 to 11-year-old students uh, vaccinated. Quiero pedirles gracias a nuestros padres que ya han llevado sus niños para recibir vacunas, pero no podemos parar. Tenemos que apoyar y ayudar a todos nuestros padres que, y por favor, que lleven sus niños para que reciben sus vacunas porque estamos mirando que casos están subiendo y, y queremos que todos nuestros niños estén seguros. We want to make sure that as our cases are rising, that, ch that our children are safe. 
So we'll give you a quick quick update on just our data that we, oh, here we go. Um, so we did, uh, we, we did see an uptick of cases. Uh, we hit over 300 for the week, uh, just the week of 1114, and we did see it dip back under 300. Uh, but again, we're still monitoring that very carefully, and you can see that the majority of it is students. Uh, that's the cumulative, and so we've also seen an uptick and also in children being quarantined. So that's the biggest concern that I have, and I want to remind our parents, again, if your children are vaccinated, they don't have to be quarantined. Uh, lo que me preocupa es con los casos subiendo, tenemos que sacar los niños de los salones, si, si, si este, tienen síntomas o si están este, en un salón donde tenemos un caso, si están vacunados, no los tenemos que sacar de los salones. Así que queremos estabilidad en los salones. We want stability in the classroom. So again, I continue to urge parents, get your children vaccinated. That way we don't have to quarantine. By the way, the other thing that I keep seeing is the ratios have still been very high. It's mostly still elementary versus high school. So uh, usually about 12 to 13 ratio 12, for every one high school student, maybe 12 to 13 that are elementary students. Y los niños que están, que tenemos que sacar de los salones son niños que de 5 a 11 años porque todavía tenemos un percentaje muy bajo que, que, nos, que están vacunados. So again, we need to raise that percentage of children getting vaccinated at the elementary level. Um, so here's the number of students now that we register for testing. So one of our goals was that by the end of this month to get to a capacity of 40,000. I will share with you and I'll show you. Um, so even though you see a dip because we had a two-day week, uh, we hit over just under 19,000 tests, over 18,000. That was in two days. So we are now have the capacity to do over 40,000 tests per, per week. And that allows us, again, to be able to, to test the children that have been consented. Again, we're going to continue to build capacity. I still want more children to consent to testing. But that was one of our goals. And that's what's going to allow us this week to begin our, our test to state pilot. And we're going to start small. Ya hemos subido la capacidad para dar exámenes de COVID. Uh, la última semana donde más tuvimos dos días de clases, tu, este, saca, este, tuvimos más de casi, este, oops, sorry. Tuvimos, este, hicimos exámenes menos, de, a, a, casi cerca de, de 19 mil, pero eran dos días. Así que ya tenemos la capacidad para hacer más de 40 mil exámenes cada semana y, co, y con eso podemos empezar un, un programa que va a estar, empezar pequeño para dar exámenes para niños que se pueden quedar en los salones uh, en lugar de sacarlos cuando, cuando hay un caso en un salón. Pero vamos a empezar eso pequeño esta semana. So that's what, it, uh, and Ali will speak a little bit more about what that pilot will look mm -hmm. like. Here's our just update on staff being fully vaccinated. Over 90 over 90 percent are fully vaccinated. Again, we still have staff that are on their first shot. We also have quite a few staff that also have received medical and religious waivers. So we're we're still very uh, happy about where we're at with staff. We're going to continue to work with our staff that are not re received vaccine just to make sure we get them the information, get them access. But again, I feel very comfortable. I'm still very concerned again on the percentages of our students. I still. We topped off at uh, for our 12 and up a while back. Uh, again, this doesn't count students that are also have on their first shot, but still in terms of fully being vaccinated, we want to get well above uh, the 50%, especially for children 12 and up. And again, six to five to 11, we continue to see increases. Uh, we saw just in that weekend of number 12, over 20,000 students getting vaccinated. It was a good start. We're still continuing to see efforts. Ali will talk about more about some of our vaccination events we're having throughout the schools. And with that, I'll bring Dr. Sontag to, to have to talk about our test to stay as well as our vaccination efforts. Thank you, CEO. Um, so a couple things, test to stay continues to be a hot topic, um, and it is one of kind of four different mechanisms for quarantine that's permissible um, in here in Illinois um, at, at the recommendation of both CDC and IDPH. There's the full 14-day quarantine. There's the 10-day quarantine without testing, which we moved to back in October. There's the seven-day test to return, which is um, a negative test to return after day seven. And then there's test to stay, which is a protocol that that was piloted um, here in Lake County in Illinois, as well as at locations throughout the country, including Utah, where students who are close contacts and unvaccinated, right, the people who would be asked to quarantine are allowed to stay in school as long as they participate in a regimented testing program. So testing on days one, three, five, and seven, um, this is something that we're continuing to investigate here at CPS. We know that there is interest and appetite that we want our kids in schools. Um, you know, as a former CPS grad and a spouse of a current teacher, 
we want to be in classrooms. We want to be with our kids. Um, we want to be teaching. So this is something that we're starting our pilot this week. Uh, we have a short list of schools that, that we will be looking at. Um, and we aren't selecting a school based on the school, right? It has to have a case. So we have a short list of schools that have expressed interest from that list. If, it, if there is a case that comes up this week, uh, we will be implementing test to stay. This will be optional. It's not required. Um, families will be offered the ability for their students who would have otherwise been asked to quarantine to stay in school and participate in this regimented testing program. We're starting with one school. The, one of the feedback we've gotten from our families is communication is key. And this is really why we're starting small, looking at the details, making sure that we have tight communications, that our families understand both this process, because it is a little odd, right? We've told you to stay home, and now we're telling you to come, right, with some caveats. So we want to make sure that we're communicating clearly to our families who would have been, whose students would have been asked to quarantine, as well as the larger school community so that we can properly prepare these students to participate in activities during the Test to Stay program. So that'll be starting at the end of this week. We're going to take our lessons learned from there and then continue to build on that. Um, really looking for the long term here. Um, we know that, you know, quarantines are necessary. Um, and this is an option that we can safely bring students back and keep them in our classroom. So really thinking about the long term here, um, vaccine continues to be the best way that we can keep our students safe and healthy and not quarantined if they're in case of an exposure, um, but looking at kind of all of the options that are made available to us. Speaking of vaccine, um, you can see on the screen, this is our vaccine advertising materials for schools. Well, this is part of that long-term strategy. So testing and vaccine in many ways go hand in hand. Vaccine gives us protection when we're in school, when we're not in school, when we travel. There's so many advantages to being vaccinated. And now that 5 to 11 vaccine is available, the vast majority of our students qualify, although recognizing that here in CPS we do have students 3 to 5 um, who are not age eligible for vaccine. And so they will have, you know, currently really just looking at the, the testing protocols. So vaccine is uh, something we're going to continue moving through through the rest of the year. This is this great marketing campaign. These are our students and they're telling their stories and we are so grateful uh, for them sharing their stories. Vaccine events here at CPS, we continue to host our four regional sites. Um, those will be running through the month of December, um, one day a week at each location. So we have Roosevelt High School, Michelle Clark High School, Richards and the Chicago Vocational. We have spots today. Uh, Roosevelt's clinic is today. There are spots available today. There are spots available at all of our regional sites if families are looking for a location to get vaccinated. We have both 5 to 11 as well as adult uh, doses of Pfizer. Um, our mobile events are continuing throughout the school district through the month of December. We're at 30 events over the next three weeks and we're continuing to scale up and look for those connections. On top of that, we have our school-based health centers, which are amazing resources within our schools. 23 of them are offering Pfizer for 12 and up and 16 of them are offering Pfizer for 11 and up. Um, you can visit our website, cps.edu forward slash vaccinations for kind of more specifics and to find a health center or a mobile event or one of our regional sites nearest you. Um, and also, you know, vaccines.gov has great resources within the community, kind of recognizing that we are part of a larger structure here at CPS. We are looking to support our families and provide them with resources, but knowing that we are part of the larger Chicago landscape and very appreciative of everything that CDPH as well as the larger medical community are doing to support getting our students vaccinated. So again, we're starting small with our test to stay, but as, as Ali said, we also have other strategies we're putting in place to try to bring children back even sooner. We reduced the quarantine period from 14 to 10 days. We're also allowing ch uh, families to get tested after the fifth day to bring them back by the seventh day. Uh, the goal for our test to stay is just to start small but expand it throughout the school year because we don't know, I can't predict for you when COVID will be at zero cases. Uh, so not knowing that, I'd rather just uh, really really plan for the long term so that we just keep building it up uh, through the end of the school year and really if, if necessary through the beginning of the next school year so that's that's really what our goal is so we're starting small to learn but just know that it's we're going to be ramping it up uh, and we're playing the we're playing the long game with this um, so with that uh, dr luna muchas gracias eh, ceo martinez y dr arwady 
Eh, les voy a estar dando las actualizaciones en español. Mi nombre es la doctora Geraldine Luna, directora médica del Departamento de Salud Pública de Chicago. Buenas tardes a todos. Primero, en las actualizaciones, el Departamento de Salud Pública de Chicago eliminó hoy dos estados de, del aviso de viajero. Eliminó a Guam, eh, también está y, el Nor y North Carolina. Estos fueron eh, porque sus tasas ahora de positividad son menos de 15 por cada 100,000 residentes durante las dos semanas consecutivas. Los otros estados aún sin en este, eh, eh, mayormente del sur, también están fuera de la lista de viajeros para aquellas personas interesadas en viajar durante las festividades. Es importante eh, tener en consideración los sitios donde pueden ir. Además, los viajeros que no estén vacunados deben so eh, someterse a pruebas de COVID antes y después de viajar desde cualquiera de los estados de la lista de aviso y deben ponerse en cuarentena al llegar a Chicago. Las recomendaciones de cuarentena y las pruebas no se aplican a personas que estén completamente vacunadas. Recuerden, sí, eh, para estas festividades, el arma más poderosa que tenemos es la vacunación en familia. Recuerde que si no está vacunado por su seguridad y las de los demás, por favor, no viaje. El enmascaramiento universal sigue aplicando porque estamos aquí en Chicago en nivel alto todavía de transmisión comunitaria del COVID-19. Los nuevos casos de COVID parecen estar disminuyendo en este momento. Tenemos 493 casos por día en un acúmulo, ¿verdad? Por promedio, por semana. 21 hospitalizaciones y la tasa de positividad está a 3.5. Eso es un incremento de la semana pasada que estuvimos a 3. Esto puede ser, esto de aparente disminución de los casos, puede deberse, sin embargo, a una tendencia que es el reflejo de la disminución de las tasas de pruebas efectuadas durante las festividades del Día de Acción de Gracia y no realmente una disminución en la transmisión comunitaria de casos de COVID. Estaremos al pendiente. 77.2% de los residentes mayores de Chicago ya han recibido por lo menos una dosis contra el COVID-19 en las vacunas del COVID-19. Este es un momento de celebración, pero también nos hace consciente que todavía tenemos camino que recorrer. Y el 70% de los residentes mayores de 12 años han completado la serie de vacunas de COVID-19 en Chicago. Esto era una meta muy importante, pero nos dice que tenemos que seguir trabajando arduamente para que nuestras comunidades estén debidamente protegidas contra el COVID-19. La Organización Mundial de la Salud acaba de nombrar al virus uh, del COVID-19 Omicron como una variante de preocupación del virus del COVID-19. Esta variante tiene una gran cantidad de mutaciones específicas que le confieren propiedades infecciosas que aumentan aún más su transmisibilidad cuando la comparamos con la variante Delta. Todavía hay mucha información que necesita investigarse. Estamos pendientes durante los próximos días dos y semanas para ver qué tan efectivas son eh, nuestras vacunas eh, contra el COVID-19 eh, con esta nueva variante y nuestras eh, em, medicinas para combatir el COVID en anticuerpos. Hasta la fecha, Omicron se ha detectado en otros países, pero aún no en los Estados Unidos. Sabemos que esto, lo, eh, lógicamente, cambia rápidamente y estamos al pendiente a la vanguardia, pero se espera que aquí se detecten casos en las próximas semanas. En este momento se necesita más datos sobre la transmisibilidad y la gravedad de la enfermedad y la eficacia de la vacuna contra esta nueva variante que es muy diferente a las variantes anteriores por tantas en mutaciones 50 y 32 son específicas para la cápsida del virus. Los científicos de todo el mundo están trabajando activamente para responder las preguntas mientras monitorean de cerca esta nueva variante en todos los países eh, del mundo. Hasta el momento las vacunas del COVID-19 en los Estados Unidos han brindado una protección increíble contra las variantes que circulan en nuestro país. Confiemos que esta sí continúe siendo la situación. Si Omicron surge en Chicago, esperamos poder identificarlo rápidamente y mantendremos al público informado a los próximos pasos a seguir. El Departamento de Salud Pública está monitoreando continuamente las variantes que surgen en nuestra ciudad. El público debe seguir continuando con las pautas de salud pública establecidas al, mom al momento que sabemos que funcionan para prevenir la propagación del virus del COVID-19. 
vacúnese y recibe una dosis del refuerzo cuando ya sea elegible. Use mascarilla en los lugares públicos encerrados. Lávese las manos con frecuencia. Mantenga una distancia física de los demás. Y si se siente enfermo, por favor, le pedimos que se quede en casa. Y siga las recomendaciones del CDC y del Departamento de Salud Pública para viajes nacionales e internacionales. Vacunarse sigue siendo la forma más protectiva contra enfermedades, hospitalizaciones y la muerte causada por el COVID-19. El Departamento de Salud Pública alienta a todas las personas que no han recibido su serie de vacunación primaria y o refuerzos que lo hagan en este momento. Este es el momento para poder terminar esta pandemia. De verdad que tenemos que erradicar lo que tenemos y protegernos contra el COVID-19. La vacuna lo protegerá a usted y a su comunidad y nos ayudará a detener la propagación del COVID-19 y las formaciones de nuevas mutaciones del covid Visite por favor a la www.chai.gov barra inclinada covid para más información. Y acuérdense que tenemos el programa de vacuna al hogar en el 312-746-4835 para que pueda recibir la vacuna en la comodidad de su hogar. E incentivos de 100 dólares por cada eh, vacunación, serie de vacunación que complete. Así que gracias. Y ahora... Protégese Chicago y le devuelvo el micrófono a la doctora Arway. Doctor Arway. We'll take some questions now. If you can identify yourself, please, and limit it to one and a follow-up. Uh, you can. Sure. All right, doctor and and, and CEO. Maybe uh, I'll ask in, in English. Maybe you can both uh, answer this question. Uh, we listened this morning from the CEO of Moderna that he thinks that his vaccine won't be won't be uh, um, uh, useful for the Omicron variant, and that he expects expect to to have to make a new vaccine, and that it would take about a hundred days. In the light of that, after, after you, you answer, I, I would like Pedro to, to tell us, I mean, if that's the case, is CPS ready for going back to virtual education? Okay, so a couple pieces in there. Um, I think, again, the pharmaceutical companies are out there. The studies are still happening, though. I want to be really clear about this related to uh, the timing of really understanding uh, both how the vaccine is working as well as some of these other questions, you know, that, that, that I was laying out before. Um, both the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines are this mRNA technology, which is good because you do have the ability to quite quickly uh, just put a different lesson in there for your immune system. Um, and so if it is decided that there is a need to do another round of boosters, and to be clear, this would be a booster, that's what it would be considered, uh, the, it, we expect it would take probably about three months to do that um, and get it made. So one of the reasons why you are seeing countries Uh, be quite aggressive around this particular variant. It's not that we're stopping COVID, but it may buy some time uh, potentially. And so, especially in Europe where they're surging right now, um, they're being careful. So I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves right now. I'm concerned right now today about the more than 600 cases that we are averaging every day here in Chicago, the you know hundreds of Chicagoans in the hospital, the unnecessary COVID that we are seeing, and All of that here is the Delta variant. It is not the Omicron variant. If we can get If we can get much more highly vaccinated right now, even recognizing it's never been a perfect vaccine, even if that efficacy drops, it helps us cut some of that cycle. It helps give some protection. Um, and I don't know for sure what the future will hold, but I don't at all want people thinking, oh, now I shouldn't get vaccinated because it isn't gonna, it isn't gonna work. Um, say we do need another booster, we might. I've said all along, if we saw a variant that came along, you know, all bets are off in terms of uh, what might that mean in terms of are, does, do these vaccines have long-term protection. This might never become a variant of high consequence. It might turn out to have been something specific about South Africa. I don't think so. I think we're going to see it here. Um, but we know what to do. You know, We've got these systems in place to monitor. We've got the ability to vaccinate. Um, and schools in particular, we have not seen be the major spreaders of COVID, like even before vaccines were available. And you know, if you remember very early on, this is one of the things I was being pretty vocal about. Um, because when you look at the data, where places take COVID seriously, that is not 
by and large, where we see COVID spread. So where they've done a good job of vaccinating, but even setting aside the vaccine, where you're masking and doing the distancing, doing some of that, like school is a safer, we saw in a big study here in Chicago that it was actually from a COVID perspective, it was safer for the kids who were in school uh, than the kids um, who were who were not. And so uh, I don't think we're likely to sort of move to a, a, a quick, you know, we've got to, we've got to sort of do this big massive shutdown. I don't know, but I do need folks right now to do what we can do right now to protect. Um, and I remain very confident about where we are and um, our ability to respond. Yeah, and I... Well, no, no just, to, just to say, um, you know, any decisions we make about schools or the school district, we're gonna do it in concert with Dr. Awadi and our health professionals. But I mean, Sí, sí, sí. Para mí, este, la pregunta es, este, decisiones que vamos a hacer si tenemos que ir remote por la, en una escuela o en el distrito total. Esas, esas decisiones los vamos a hacer con los expertos de, de médicamente de Dr. Awari de, de la ciudad, del Departamento de, 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 de Medicina aquí de la ciudad y también nuestros profesionales médicos, porque uh, nosotros sabemos lo que dijo, dijo la, la señora Dr. Awari, que cuando uno mira estudios de, de casos de COVID, por ejemplo, ahorita en las escuelas, los casos están menos de, están de tre, casi 300 por semana, comparado con la ciudad que está a 600 por día. Entonces, lo que los estudios han, están enseñando en el pasado es que los niños están más seguros en las escuelas que a veces que en la comunidad. So, one of the things that we know from what Dr. Abadia said is the studies have shown, and we're seeing it even today, our cases in our schools per week are hovering around 300. I mean, it, we were about 200 for a while, and then we went up to, we would, did go up to 400, and then we were now closer to 300. That's per week versus 600 cases per day in the city. So studies have shown, as Dr. Wardy said, that schools are safe places. I've been in schools. I've seen the procedures in place. With that, again, um, you know, we will, any decisions we make about any going remote, either at a school level or district level, we'll do it in concert with Dr. Awadi, our health professionals, both at CDPH as well as our own health professionals, uh, and we'll be prepared. We'll be prepared. Uh, and so, you know, uh, we've, we're making contingency plans in case after the holidays, uh, and hopefully we don't have to use them. But again, I want those decisions um, and that guidance to really come from the medical professionals. Hi, this is Aaron Gettinger with the Hyde Park Herald. The epidemiological curve in South Africa is really scary, and I know it's not happening in a vacuum. It's happening in concert with a lot of other things in that country, but if it would take off here, can you talk about the ways, you know, contingency plans in Chicago for testing and hospital capacity, how that would be, you know, ramped up in a worst case scenario in any capacity? Yeah, sure. Um, and I think, you know, it's important that the reason I showed that epidemiologic curve is it is concerning. This is why why action has been taken so quickly. Um, I will note that cases, though, actually remain relatively low in South Africa. It's just that the percentage of them have shifted to this Omicron variant and this is where understanding sort of the transmissibility and how ill people get is going to be an important part of this question the beta variant actually um, was one that was first really detected and largely emerged in South Africa high level that was a variant of concern high level of concern never actually became a huge issue here in the US now I am more concerned about this one than I am the beta just based on some of these other things um, but we don't know what I can say is that the non pharmaceutical interventions. That's the fancy word for things besides drugs and vaccines. Uh, they work if we have to use them. The masks help. There have been studies actually around the world now, you know, comparing places that, that, that have some of this in place and that don't. I have no desire and no plans at this point to have to be closing things down, shutting things down. Um, if we had to go there, that would only be in the setting of if we were really seeing major threats to our healthcare system. That we That's what we've said all along, where uh, you can't, and I've seen this sort of firsthand, what happens when a healthcare system gets overwhelmed, you end up with so much indirect problems where people can't get treatment for their heart attacks and their diabetes and whatever else um, that you can't really tolerate that. We are nowhere near that and nothing that I'm seeing at this point is making me hugely concerned about going there. I'm extremely confident in these vaccines and in this technology. It's great that we have this mRNA vaccine because the ability, I mean, think about it, it took us a year to get to that first vaccine. To have, if we need a booster, to have that within three, you know, within three months is a very big deal. And I expect people to 
continue to have protection from the current vaccines. Probably not as high of protection, but, but probably protection, including from the more severe outcomes. The last thing I'll note is these new drugs that are not yet approved yet from the FDA, but I am expecting to see approval from them um, even in December, most likely. The preliminary results of one of them showed that if people had COVID, it cut their risk of hospitalization or death by 90%. Uh, and I would not expect that to work differently against a variant because it doesn't have to do with the genetic code, it has to do with the enzymes. So there, we're adding new tools all the time. Um, and if we need to, you know, we'll fall back on the things that we had to do, but I have no plans to do that. And I'm confident we're as prepared as we have ever been and even more so. I have questions about surveillance, but just a, a follow-ups about surveillance, but a follow-up about the um, antiviral pills that you were talking mm -hmm. about, even with the you know information, I think Merck's pill was not as effective as they were saying it is. You still think they could be an effective strategy? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah, Merck, Merck and Pfizer's work differently. I think Pfizer's is just the way that it's set up is more likely to um, be be effective. We'll see. I mean, the studies are being done, but even something that cuts, I think people don't remember. We've never expected a vaccine to be 100% protective. There's no such thing. Uh, we don't expect a drug even to be 100% protective. The FDA had said even a vaccine that was 50% protective, they would give the green light to because that has the potential to really shift the whole pandemic. You know, we've gotten sort of spoiled by vaccines that started at a 90 something percent percent. You know, if we see that drop to the 80, maybe to the 70, maybe even further, it doesn't mean it's not still having a huge role in protection. And similarly, I think drug advances, we've not had a lot of drug advances honestly, uh, to this point, antivirals are hard to make. Um, I think that has the potential to be actually a pretty significant breakthrough. Um, we, if COVID didn't make people seriously ill, put them in the hospital and make them die, we wouldn't be as, you know, if this were a much more mild illness, we wouldn't be as concerned about it as we are. And a lot here about surveillance to follow up. I'm just going to spew them all out if you can try to answer as much as you can. You know, how much, if you could quantify, has Chicago and Illinois sequencing increased since we detected Alpha and Delta last winter and spring? I'm also curious why the CDC isn't doing more surveillance at O'Hare. Um, the federal uh, thing this morning said something about express check that's not going on, I'm assuming, for international passengers there. I'm also wondering if CDPH is doing contact tracing or collecting information on international arrivals for contact tracing at the airport if cases are identified to follow up with people there. Okay, so to sort of hit on all of that lightly, um, CDPH is not specifically collecting traveler information. However, the um, it's called the Division of Global More the, the Division of Global Migration and Quarantine at the CDC, the DGMQ, is working to collect information about travelers sort of from these countries. They're working on sort of getting that, we were on a call yesterday, getting information to, you know, states and to locals, um, still figuring out a little bit of what that process looks like. Frankly, um, I think what we have seen from prior travel follow-up is that the most important thing that that does is really buy time in a lot of ways as opposed to really stop it. And I just want to remind people that when you test somebody and you find it, you know, it's here already. It's the vaccine that really helps um, prevent it. I think related to how much we're doing, so we're doing, remember I told you that at the national level, there is enough that's happening that one in 10,000 um, samples, basically, if you've got 10,000, if you're doing, if there are 10, if one in 10,000 uh, COVID people with COVID here has a variant, you'll detect it with all the nationwide surveillance together. Here in Chicago, our contribution just from the Ripple, the regional, is about one in 100. So if there's about 100 people who are getting tested and we identify you know, one in 100 would have a new variant, we would find it in that setting, not counting the additional testing that we do when there are outbreaks or breakthrough cases. Um, and then, sorry, what was the middle question? Uh, well, I had a lot of stuff about O'Hare. I was wondering if you could oh, O'Hare. how much the sequencing in Chicago and Illinois Illinois, I know your Chicago has increased since we got Alpha, I think, last Yeah, December sure. Delta. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah, we really, I mean, so the, the, prior to COVID, um, really the CDC or academic lab, a few academic labs were about all that we had available to do real genetic sequencing in any kind of level. Um, and it used to be very expensive, et cetera, et cetera. And so it was a priority of ours really very early on. I mentioned the Walder Foundation um, put some money up very early uh, to help get some of the academic partners together on the wastewater surveillance side. Um, and then on the lab surveillance side, we've been working to make sure not just that like a hospital is testing, but that we're capturing 
ordering it from hospitals across the city, including ones that may not have you know as advanced lab capability on site, for example. Um, and so we are, you know, we've gone from doing virtually none of that at the beginning of COVID to, you know, at a point where one in 10,000 across the U.S. and, you know, at a very good level here in Chicago, um, we can detect. And so, um, you know, this genomic epidemiology is one of the spaces that is kind of the future of public health. Um, and it's one of, it's been, it's been a priority of mine from the beginning to make these kinds of investments, because it's not just for COVID, it's for whatever is coming. Um, somebody has tuberculosis, understanding what that genetic fingerprint is, helps you actually uh, work on that tuberculosis case um, throughout the city. Very good, thanks. Mm -hmm. Hi, Meredith Barrick with CBS2. Dr. Arwady, I'll let you catch your breath. Um, <laughs> I actually have a question for uh, Mr. Martinez here. Um, we know testing is very low in certain neighborhoods. Is that something that the district is okay with or are you doing things to get those numbers up? No, no, so, so now that we've built up the capacity, because now we finally caught up, remember we were in a gap uh, at the beginning, now we can pivot and be more strategic. So one of the, and we'll see with this new variant whether this still applies, I'd like to get a minimum of 10% per school because that's a, again, uh, so one of the markers to get a, at least a representative sample of, of what's happening in the school. So that's where we're going to be going next. And so we just hit the 40,000 this week. So now that will be our next step. So my goal will be a minimum percent of every school. Right now, not knowing more about the variant, a minimum of 10 percent, of course, we'll, we'll adjust it as we learn more about the variant. But the capacity is going to continue to grow. So we're not stopping. Uh, so really for us, we just wanted to hit this mark so that we could catch up. In this pilot program that is going to be starting, what can you tell us? Can you tell us what school it's at, or can you give us any details? Is it a high school, elementary school? What students will it be targeting? So we're starting with elementary because that's where we're seeing the biggest racial quarantine. Uh, and so we are we first are working. So some of some of our families have to get comfortable with it. So you might think that every family wants this, but that's not true. So we actually are working with the principals. That's why, uh, as Ali said, we have a list of schools that are interested now. And of course, we have to wait for cases, of course, because we don't just do it for you know nine cases. And so that's going to start this week, and then we're just going to continue to ramp up and learn. And like I said, for me, the, the long game is we're going to just keep doing it. Uh, we're just going to keep building it. And my hope is that as we get to the end of the year, we have the capacity with low cases that this will really help us benefit it so that we're not seeing such high numbers of quarantine. Uh, but it's starting small this week, but we're going to just keep building it up. And so as we do more media uh, updates, we'll give you more information about what more schools. But for sure, it's starting this week. Fantastic. Thank you. And and I'll just add to that, um, test to stay is exciting, but I always tell people vaccinate to stay is actually the most important piece there. Like if your child is vaccinated, they get to stay in school unless they develop symptoms. So, you know, it's sort of an interim while we're working on getting kids vaccinated you, too. Yes. <laughs> Nader, you so with the Sun-Times. Um, as a decision, uh, CEO Martinez, you mentioned you would consult with CDPH on any decisions regarding individual schools or the district as a whole. What goes into that decision? It, it, let's say Omicron turns out to be a variant of high consequence. Does that trigger something? Is it the number of cases? Is it test positivity? Uh, there have been a ton of different metrics used yeah, over the past sure. year. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So a um, few things. So at the sort of city level or the country level, if, if say, Omicron is decided to be a, a, does become a variant of high consequence, um, that's where we would probably be thinking about are there things that we need to do different as a strategy at the national level, for example, or at the city level. Um, and uh, CPS, like all of our other schools, would sort of be part of that larger decision. What we're looking at locally is a few things. So um, first of all, we work really closely every single day. My team at CDPH works with the um, Office of Student Health and Wellness at CPS. And whenever there are cases in school, that team is doing the contact tracing uh, within the school setting. And then my team is doing the contact tracing for outside the school setting, what's in the home, where else were people going, putting that information together. In addition, when we identify multiple cases within a school. The question is, is there likely transmission within the school? Is this, you know, two, two siblings who happen to be at different grades but more likely were Im impacted at home? And so every day also we're sharing back and forth where are we seeing that information. Our epidemiologists um, and investigators are working with theirs and we're basically looking to say, do we think that there is a sort of a, a, a potential risk here? Um, and so 
we really do individualize this to the the situation. Um, we're looking at what's happening in a given school. If I've got a school of you know four thousand children and there's three positives here, or there, ever that are not connected, I am not concerned about that. They are they were um, very likely infected outside of the school setting. Whereas if you had um, you know four children in one small classroom without other exposures, that would be more likely to be a school setting. And that's some of the decisions that we're making where we're thinking about things like quarantine and whether it would be appropriate. Um, so uh, all of this, as Mr. Martinez says, is absolutely in the context of what is our local risk. So we are at a high risk because we're um, over 400 cases a day with good testing, uh, but we're not at very high, right? And we're, we're nowhere near where we've been previously. Um, and again, with a vaccine available, um, knowing that schools were already a relatively place, safe place to be from COVID before a vaccine was available, I'm really confident that we're going to be able to, you know, by and large, keep schools open and unless there is some you know, major national change there um, and keep protecting, most importantly, children and their families while we do it. And let's say there does appear to be, or turn out to be a need for a new booster to be mm -hmm. developed. Um, while that's being developed, would there be any consideration to making any changes to um, the method of learning, how many kids are in school, anything like that? Yes. Or would it sort of depend on the local Yeah, it, 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 it would depend. I think um, the way I think this is likely to play, I think there will likely be an Omicron variant detected in the U.S. very shortly, um, if not, you know, if not already connected, co collected. Uh, and we'll be knowing more in the next couple of weeks, as I said, about um, how, what the level of concern is related there. Um, I, we also have the ability of having some countries that are a little bit of ahead of us in a not good way here in terms of having had some more spread, had some more impact. So we watch very carefully what's happening in those countries. Um, and if we needed to make some other decisions, we would. But we're not making any, you know, we of course have plans and we know how to do it if we needed to make some of those shifts. Um, but there are not current plans to do that. Thanks. Um, Michelle Gallardo with ABC7. I have a question first for CEO Martinez and then one for you, Dr. Arwadi. Um, CEO Martinez, I'd just like to ask you to uh, comment on a report, ask you what you know about um, uh, the CPS Marine Academy commandant in charge of the ROTC, we're told, uh, has tested positive for COVID after not being vaccinated and he's already back in the building. Are you able to confirm this? What can you tell us about this report? Yeah, no, so actually um, the individual was uh, was removed and this was mainly just, um, just, uh, just frankly spreading false information about vaccines, which is just contrary to everything that Dr. Wadi and I have been, have been preaching and speaking about. Um, so the individual was just allowed to just come and uh, take some other things, uh, but, but they're not in the building right now. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. And Dr. Arwadi, just a, a question on, um, and it's more of a follow-up to what we've been talking about, boosters. Um, we are, you know, as we've said, they, there are reports that we're gonna, Moderna, Pfizer might be developing a booster that can handle Omicron, right, within the next few months. Well, should we be telling people then to get a booster now, or should those folks be waiting three yeah. months for the new booster to be developed? Because, I mean, even people who might not be vaccine hesitant because they're already fully vaccinated are gonna be reluctant to be getting shots every three months, for example. Absolutely. I want people to get a booster now. Why do I want people to get a booster now? Because right now, forget Omicron, Delta is doing a job on Chicago uh, and on the upper Midwest. And every single day we are seeing people get COVID, have breakthrough infections, meaning they've been vaccinated, but they but they get COVID. When they get breakthroughs, they're much less likely to be hospitalized and die. Um, but nevertheless, when people are older, especially, and they have underlying conditions, we have this vaccine available. and. I want people to be as protected as possible. I felt very comfortable gathering over, you know, the holidays and 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 really having a relatively normal um, life at the moment. I'm going to the theater. I'm going to the restaurant. I'm doing all that because I am vaccinated and boosted. Because I know that the people around me, uh, at least who are close, are vaccinated and boosted. And I can't 
predict 100% what the future may be. But what I have learned over and over and over again is you do not want to wait for a potential worst case scenario, right? And at all points here, we have tried to do what we can to stay open and to stay safe. Clearly right now, um, the, the the getting your first and second dose is the most important thing, the most important thing. Like if I could get everybody in Chicago just to get their primary dose done, honestly, we'd be done. We wouldn't even need the booster. Like, you know what I mean? Like this would not even be such a scenario, but where we are, given that we still have a lot of people who are not vaccinated, um, and we continue to see a high level of spread, the booster that is available now is safe and effective, and I strongly encourage people to get it. If we need to be doing another one down the line, we will. It's a pandemic, um, but my hope is not. Uh, but either way, I don't want people thinking again that they should wait. Um, I, we're in a surge, and no signs of it slowing down at this point. Thanks, everybody. Oh. Thank you. Oh, oh one, one more. <laughs> Are you all right? Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it's not nearly as esoteric as the other ones. The CDC's definition of fully vaccinated hasn't changed. Right. Um, but should businesses that are limiting entry to vaccinated customers consider limiting entry to customers that have gotten boosters? Do we have any information whether boosters make individuals less likely to get COVID-19 or are less likely to be contagious if they get a breakthrough infection? Oh. So yes, boosters make people less likely to get COVID-19. Yes, they make people less likely to spread it. Large, you still can, but you're much less likely to, the, the time of, of infection is lower, the symptoms are lower. Um, and yes, the vaccine, um, for any public health reason, meaning for work, to get into a theater, a restaurant, whatever, uh, remains that primary series because it is by far the most important. Um, to your earlier question, I think if we were really at a point where truly there needed to be a booster, that because the prior level was not showing as much, that could be a setting where perhaps we could be having a booster requirement. Um, but that is not something, again, that is planned at the moment. And right now, that booster is especially important for people who are older and with underlying conditions. Um, and it's one of the tools that we have right at the moment. Thanks, Yep. Thanks.